being confident in our statements, but uh, actually when it comes to assessing environmental states for uh, marine environments, uh, how confident are we in the uh, classifications that are coming out? And uh, can we quantify the uncertainties that are associated with these uh, assessments? And how will we use it in decision making? Now, actually, uh, Voltaire, he coined that quite nicely with this uh, statement up here. Uh, uncertainty is an uncomfortable position, but uncertainty is that absurd point. So we have to live with uncertainty. Uncertainty is just something that is somehow penetrating through all aspects of our lives. In most cases, we do not consider uncertainty. It's just something that um, we have sort of built into our life. Um, we can take the question about what is the status of the Baltic Sea? So if we want to address that, we might use the NEED tool and might say, well, we have uh, GES, or we might not have achieved good environmental status. <coughs> but how confident are we in this, and how are we going to use that for decision making? Well, it might be that the NEED tool tells us that we are 58% you know, sure that it's uh, achieving GES, or that it's 42% sure that it's uh, non-GES. But, you know, being 58% confident that we have achieved GES might not be sufficient in some cases. We might require a higher confidence. And that's why there are different approaches to actually address this uncertainty and use that and include that in decision making. One, taking a precautionary principle, um, which is in water framework directive is called the fail-safe approach. And that is, for instance, assuming or at least requiring that we should be at least 90% confident that we have achieved GES. In that case, it will turn out to be non-GES. The other thing is actually to let, to take the other, uh, other approach that is, assuming that we have not achieved GES, but then um, taking, if we just want to be 90% sure that we have not achieved non-GES, then we can come to the conclusion that we have actually GES. So that's a precautionary principle for the polluters. So, how do we do all that? How do we get to this, you could say, final classification with uncertainties, etc.? The whole point in the need, that is, that we aggregate distributions from the indicators all the way through the different levels of aggregation. And this is how it works in the need tool, as you can see, and we're getting uncertainty distribution on different levels. So, all what it takes is that we need to associate all the indicators that we have in the need tool not only with the value itself, but we also need to supply the standard error of that indicator um, to get to these overall uh, uncertainty calculations. And that's done in a new tool like this. So it might be a little bit difficult then for many people, many users, to supply that standard error. And we acknowledge that because it's you know calculating you know statistics and, and doing all this kind of stuff. Many people, they consider that to be uh, quite difficult. And that's why we have developed an uncertainty framework that will help people to actually come up with a correct estimate of the uncertainty. Let's take an example, and this is the eutrophication indicator. This is the chlorophyll A. And this is from uh, an assessment unit where we have two stations, and it's measured over a six year period. Now, in this case, what we're interested in is not just the data themselves. We'd like to assess what is the overall chlorophyll level over the entire period and also over the entire assessment uh, unit. And for this, to address that better, we have developed this um, framework where we actually have identified all the potential sources of variation that there might be in typical monitoring data that we have. And we divided that into variations that are uh, temporal, some that are spatial, and some that are methodolo uh, methodological. The ones that are temporal can be into annual variations, seasonal variations, annual variations, and some regular temporal variations. And the spatial variations can be both on a large scale and can be on a smaller scale. And also, depending on what type of monitoring data we have, that can be uh, methodological variations. Typically, one of the most pronounced variations is the variation between persons. But overall, the point is not identifying these sources of variation. For having a quantitative framework like we've included it in the need, we also need to assess how large are these sources of variation. And just an example, just to tell you how important it is, if you have 30 measurements, it really matters whether you're going to place all those 30 measurements like in one month within a six-year uh, period or whether you're going to distribute a bit more unit time and space. So let's, let's get back to, to that example of chlorophyll. In this case, we have two stations. But assessing the variation between the space variation between two stations is not going to give us a very good estimate of, say, what is the variation. And that's why we need to work on larger data sets. So we have a lot of assessment units like this. Um, this is both in Denmark and Sweden. 
we can actually estimate all the different sources of variation based on, you could say, variations within all the different uh, assessment units that we have here. And the whole point behind this is actually that these <coughs> variations can be considered more like constant because if, as long as the systems that we're looking at are more or less similar, then um, they will not change. That's our, you could say, our conclusion so far. So the whole idea is actually to take some of these estimates of variations or variances that we use for assessing the overall uncertainty of the indicator and put them into an uncertainty online library. So we have them more as constant. So how does this work if we're going to calculate the uncertainty, the standard error of an indicator? Well, we have the data to the right over there. So this is typically something that we do for each individual system. But then we also have some parameters, some fixed parameters you can consider. And when you put that all into the big pot here, then you can come up with an estimate of the uh, standard error of the indicator. This is essentially not witchcraft. This is actually based on sound scientific principles. And we have described this in this publication that came up this year uh, in um, ecological indicators. Now, the point is that it requires calculations that you cannot do in a spreadsheet. So that's why you should try to do it. Don't attempt to do that. The whole idea and, and what I think will be the future and, and what we should aim at is actually to start developing standard routines that actually does that. For instance, in a library like R that's available to most people, so that people can extract the data from the monitoring database, they can use the indicators, and then they can get the calculated the cal indicator out with their uncertainty. So with this, I see that uh, this is not really the end of, you could say, the work we devote. It might be the final conference. But I see there's a lot of work lying ahead of us in terms of implementing the indicators, getting all the uh, quantitative estimates of the indicator values and its uncertainties, and getting that into an assessment system like the need. Thank you.